how's life treating you before we get into the yeah, very well. yeah very well we're, uh, we're we're busy we haven't really stopped we were just chatting away that um so we uh we locked down as, as everybody did for a short period of time this is lucasfilm so uh, we went into a period where we stopped on andor which is uh, uh, the next uh, show that we worked on after we finished on the films and um, but very quickly uh, the industry is unbelievable isn't it it will come back it fights it doesn't uh, sit down for a minute yeah. so we, um, we 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 started back up to finish andor and now we're presently working in wales good old wales doing willow which is the next series of uh, shows they're doing which is due to be concluded just before uh, just before the christmas break so yeah. So yeah, life goes on, it doesn't stop. Daft question, because it's disrupted everybody, but how disruptive was it to the industry? I, in all honesty, it, was, it, it didn't really disrupt us at all. I mean, there was that obvious period where, uh, you know, everybody was unsure, everybody was um, nervous and scared about what, what the pandemic really meant to them. But the, in, the industry itself was so quick to, I think, set in place protocols and, and a kind of methodology of how you deal with it. That um, yeah, it, it felt like a, a sort of you know, and I hope this is true for most people here. It, it felt like a sort of enforced break yeah. rather than, than anything other than that. And then we were right, you know, we came straight back into it, and, and as confidence has built, um, and the protocols have got tighter, or, or should I say better, it, it doesn't really, you know, it hasn't. They've been a, a, incredible at being able to do with that. So I mean, of course, those things cost huge amounts of money. Yeah. So yeah. yeah. There is always that advantage. Yeah. Has there been anything that's come out of the back of that that, that that you would sort of see as an innovation that you think might make things better in terms of film production? Um, I think it's it, what's really interesting is that the pandemic has completely changed the film industry. I think what up until the point of, of lockdown, we were an industry that has since time began refined and and and, and found. A kind of way of working yeah. and an understanding of how we all work as, as, as this fractious group of people, and the idea of working away from home, or the idea of, 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 of sort of making projects outside of, say, the cinema release system, yeah. uh, hadn't really come into, in, into into play. And during that lockdown period, I think the studios kind of reconsidered it completely. Yeah. And now we see, obviously, this enormous amount of work that's hit. Um, uh, the industry here in, 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 in the UK and we've, we all have to, especially in, in my world but I'm sure it's for every department, really had to consider what it's like to not have to be able to make, not able to make a phone call and just get a hundred people to come and work with you yeah. because those people are now all being used on different productions. So, yeah. so the industry has, has exploded and become a place that I have never experienced in my lifetime and probably the, the, the most vibrant and the most opportunist, opportunist time yeah. that I've ever known. So it, 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 something yeah, made everybody reconsider it right from the very, very top. I mean, I fear for cinema. Yeah. I wonder if, if cinema is going to suffer in the long term because so much of the, the shows that are being made now are being made um, you know, for um, uh, pay for, for yeah, yeah. Uh, subscri sub subscription TV. Um, but yeah, that's and that's you know. So to be honest, uh, uh, apart from some of the th those worrying aspects, it has been incredibly positive yeah. what's come out of it. And probably maybe it was due to happen at some point, but and, and this just happened. Yeah. Or maybe it was it was a consequence of. of, of I need to rethink. People were watching things at home, weren't they? And yeah. Enjoying them. Yeah. 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 It's inter interesting what you say. That Lucas said it years ago that eventually going to the cinema will be like going to the opera, and it will be a dress up event thing. Yeah. Maybe this is the time that that changeover happens. Yeah, I I, I, I agree. Yeah. Maybe that's what it is. Yeah, it, it's it's. I mean, I, I know when you know when I was younger. You know, it's quite right now. Um, <laughs> uh, there, I used to think that cinema was, was was very clever because you would go to the ticket booth, wouldn't you? And ticket booth, you would buy a ticket, and then you would walk up towards this sort of this opening stairways, the stairways to heaven. Yeah. And you'd walk up the stairs, and the doors would open, and you'd walk in. And, and uh, being brutally honest, last time I went to the cinema, it was, it was, it was so sterile. I mean, you just walked into this room that was completely, and there were ten cinemas, and you walked in, and it was a cold black room. Yeah. And you sort of think, to some extent, we've 
where's that where's that feeling that here's your here's your showcase film yeah and we're really going to show it to you in a way so yeah i think maybe that could also be a positive that yeah. cinema distributors and cinemas themselves um even even on the kind of mass level really need to think about because the film is so precious and wonderful isn't it if yeah. you want it to be presented to you that way yeah. it makes it different than watching it at home yeah i mean you, you say that in the presentation the magic of the presentation mm. of cinema and you yourself have been involved in the creation of that mm. tell us a little bit about how that all bit right to when you were a kid what grabbed you what sort of led you in <laughs> okay so um so I, I'm probably lucky or unlucky, depending which way you want to look at it, which was, uh, and I remember when I was, I, I must have been about six years of age, my father had let me stay up late one night, late for me anyway at six, and uh, there was a film called Jason and the Argonauts, which was a Ray Harryhausen film, if anybody here remembers those films. And um, there is a sequence where Talos, this huge bronze statue, comes to life, and um, quite frankly, at that moment in time, people say this of them, but a light went on, yeah. and I knew at that point that's exactly what I wanted to do. And there was no negotiation, there was no lack of, of clarity. Yeah. Something switched itself on, and I became an absolute Harryhausen fanatic. I mean, I went to bed with Ray Harryhausen every night, yeah. um, and uh, you know, and pulled over his books and pulled over his work, and it completely encapsulated me and, and, and took me to a place and just motivated me. Yeah. Um, so really, from that moment on, I just, and in those days there was no internet, there was no way of finding how to do things, so you had to, one, use your own imagination, I suppose, and your own inventiveness, or pour through magazines, tiny magazines that, like Starlog or whatever, to find that little picture that was that next little bit of the jigsaw puzzle. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and that really just, that drove me to our, you know, that led me to our college, in a sense, where I did a, a foundation, and, uh, a, partial BA course. I never finished my Bachelor of Arts course because uh, I went to see a company called Cosgrove Hall who were a stop motion company. That was my dream place to go yeah. and work at the time and I went to visit them and showed them my work and they offered me a job. Um, I didn't tell them I was at college, I pretended I wasn't. And, um, and then uh, because they offered me that job I had to make that choice and so I decided that that was where my heart most lay. So, I went to join Cosgrove Hall. I spent a period of time working with Cosgrove Hall, a few years, about five years, I think, with Cosgrove. And it was wonderful, it was lovely. And then uh, I made a move, a lucky move, down to London where this whole new thing was sort of coming off the back of films like Greystokes and Crystal, yeah, yeah. which obviously Jim Henson and his team of people. Um, so this new thing called Animatronics was happening. And so uh, at that time, animation was falling in, into the sort of shadows. Yeah. Animatronics was taking over. And so I found myself in that world and, and then just continued uh, in, and have continued in that environment ever since. Yeah. Do you think if, if that Harry Hansen light, light bulb moment hadn't happened that you wouldn't have found this profession or do you think somehow it was destined? Yeah, I, I don't think I would have found this profession. I think, I, I think um, yeah, I think I, I'm, a, I'm a maker of things. I, I never stop making things and, and when I don't make things at work, which I no longer do very much, I still make things at home different and, yeah. and my interest is obviously in the, 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 the real tangible world. The digital world is one that fascinates me but I'm not sure if I'm wired the right way for that. Sure. But whether it would have led me into the film industry without Ray being there, I'm not sure. It happened so early that it kind of really did define who I was. So yeah. I kind of knew who I was at that point. Yeah. yeah. It's funny when you think of people like Harry Harryhausen in that time period, like Willis O'Brien came before and then Harry Harryhausen was sort of his student. And there weren't that many. There weren't that many mega effects films. Yeah. There weren't that many geniuses like Harry Housen, So yeah. it doesn't seem to be quite the same now because he's exploded in such a way. Yeah, I mean, he was he was he was an ex he was an exceptional human being, yeah. and he was also a, he zealously guarded his techniques as well, which I can see absolutely why he would. So he was so therefore he was dominant, I think, during that period yeah. and. and and as such, um, it created a, 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 a place of his own, wasn't it? Harry, there was something about going to see a Harryhausen film that no other film could do. So it was an event. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You mentioned animatronics, obviously. It's such a marriage of different disciplines and a lot of things come together to make it work. And doing what you do, you're a collaborative person because you've got to be. Did that? Was that a big attraction to what you were doing? Um, I think what happens is 
if you are, uh, if you, yeah, yeah. there's a point in your life when you realise you can't do it all, yeah. and uh, as much as you wish to want to do it, do it all, you have to decide: do you do you want to stay just just doing what you do, or do you want to try and fulfil a larger ambition by working with other and, and, and working with other people? And so I think that that is just a natural progression in, 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 in uh, not necessarily natural, but one of the avenues that you can take along the line. And so. What became a wonderful challenge for me was was when I worked with uh, the Jim Henson Creature Shop, and, uh, and unfortunately we had lost Jim several years before. That, that that we needed to embrace, I think, the whole bigger thing and and, and grow that company in somehow. And the only way of growing that company was to, to was literally to start to work, you know, on a, on a you know, take projects on design them uh, in a sense along with the production team as to what you're going to try and do, how are you going to do that and then and then have people around you that you could train or, or work with and you have to train some people who are brilliant anyway. Um, and so you kind of just naturally grow into that place really. Yeah. yeah. That must have been a very special time working at Henson. Just because of yeah. the history of it, because everybody knows it, it's so beloved. Yeah, well I think I think the thing about work I, I am incredibly lucky and I consider myself to be incredibly lucky because when I first got involved I was paid to make mistakes. Right. So we were just a bunch of people who didn't know what we were doing. We had no idea of what we were doing. We, it was a technology that that was, you know, um, undefined and we would make things and they would break and they would go wrong and you know, and then we'd remake them. And uh, you know, that's what I think was ultimately uh, incredibly privileged. You see, you, today, the pressure on so many people, on all of us, is to come into your respective industry or respective discipline and be really good at it right from the start. Yeah. And I think sometimes I have to check myself when I ex my expectations of, of people coming into the industry. Is, you know, I had that opportunity to do things that way. Yeah. And Jim was just the the, the ultimate uh, mentor in that way. Yeah. I mean, you know, he was. He was, a, he was a, a, a wonderful, beautiful human being that loved what he did and really, I suppose to be fair, I was really honest, didn't really care how much money he spent doing it. <laughs> and, uh, you know, and so he was able to, you know, uh, he allowed these people, all of these people, so, so many of them went on to do so many other things in the industry. Yeah. Uh, when you look at uh, the, the kind of, you know, the people that passed through Jim's world that went on to do directing and producing as well as the stuff that we're more, more familiar with in the puppetry. So yes, it was it was a golden period. I yeah. Think. yeah. One of the things yeah. you just said there was was I'm paraphrasing, but you, you almost have to fail to progress and move on. It's almost yeah. as important to get something wrong as it is to get it right the first time. You learn so much from it. Absolutely, fate. I mean, it's uh, you know good old Trish Trish Bagman, isn't it? Up from the ashes grow the roses of success. So, <laughs> you know, there you go. Uh, yeah, you have to. You have to. Uh, you, you, I think to some extent you do, and I think what's but there is also a point where you have to, uh, you have to. Uh, well, I think there's a point where what you do matures. You go through that, and and your your knowledge or your wisdom or your experience tells you uh, when you might be, might be putting your foot wrong. And there may be something where, and I think that's probably, if anything, uh, what I have uh, more more than most is that I'm quite old now. <laughs> <laughs> and that wisdom is what you learn over the years sure. because you have that chance. So, so it's 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 easier now, I think, to be able to guide to guide what we do and how we do it, uh, so that it is successful and we fail less for that sure. reason because yeah. we've had that chance to do those. But yeah, you mentioned the Harry Howes and light bulb moment in your line of work. And Brian's in this, you know, similar realm as well. Mm. Is there a moment when you? When you think, I think I've got this, and I think this is this is going to progress, because there's always a point in any job when you think, I might not be doing this for the rest of my life. Mm -hmm. This might not be my my mm -hmm. thing. Was there a moment when you thought, I think I've got this? No. You still no. you still think? Absolutely. Yeah. I, I I think that um, um, I think the, I, you get you, you gain confidence, yeah. and you gain experience, so you you get better at what you do. Yeah. But I think, you know, for instance, if we take Force Awakens, when we, when we sort of came to do Force Awakens with JJ and Kathleen Kennedy, they had no real-world experience of animatronics at all. They, you know, Kathleen had more yeah. than JJ, and JJ had grown up through that, was a big fan of it, but actually was probably not very, hadn't been exposed to that many practical effects in the films that he was doing. And I think that when we 
set out to do the things that we did, you have that same, that same, you have, you're trying to do something you, you've done it before, but you haven't done it before. Yeah. So you're never really quite sure whether it is going to work out. You just have to have the confidence and the conviction and just, to be honest, the nerve yeah. and the trust in all the people that are working with you to do something and hope it will work. Yeah. It does. And then if it doesn't, then maybe experience tells you at a certain point to be able to change tack, to draw it back to somewhere. But yeah. I don't think you ever get to that place where, I don't know, I haven't anyway, where yeah. you think, oh, I nailed this, it's yeah. easy, you yeah. know, or, or this is it. Yes, there is an element of, yes, we know what we can do. But um, I think always in the back of your mind, you're trying to push things a little bit harder. Yeah. So that puts you in a slightly unnervy place or yeah. a less comfortable place. Yeah. When we spoke, obviously we spoke for inside at length, uh, and one of the things that, that sort of came out, to, came out of that to me was, as years move on, technology progresses. In, but in other fields, it progresses as well. So now there's this nice marriage between the CG world, the practical world, People would assume the CG world has gone leaps and bounds, but your world has as well. To mm -hmm. the point where it's not always a given which character will be one or the other. Yes. Um, stepping back briefly to, to Babe, obviously, which is the big Oscar win for yourself. How how was the mixture on that one? Because CG technology then was fairly still bedding itself in your technology. I would imagine for that particular show, was very bespoke, mm -hmm. very brand new sort of new. What was the marriage like on that particular film? So I, I think with, with uh, a lot of the projects that we worked on, and Babe would be a good example of that, is that certainly at, uh, at the time where CG was much more in, in its infancy, um, well, the only way to get a pig to talk was to do a, an animatronic version of it. And hopefully that animatronic version would be convincingly enough uh, to the audience to, to believe that they're actually watching a real, a real pig talk. CG, it w uh, in, in, at the time of Babe, it was possible for them to do it, but it was extremely labour intensive, extremely long process, and extremely yeah. expensive. Yeah. Um, and there was also, I suppose, that middle ground doubt in George Miller's mind of whether or not you'd actually get the performance of the real animal enough to be able to do any form of, of kind of CG on top of yeah, it. Sure. So, so the premise was we should try to achieve everything practically, and where we can't achieve it practically, then we'll have then we'll have to do CG because that's the, that's our only other version. And as as Babe was one of the first films, if probably the first film where where the animals were ex, were designed as such to be able to talk with lips rather than just uh, yeah. uh, or as a narrative that Disney had done before. Then it was imperative that you know you try to get as many shots practically because. Um, uh, the budget would have been undefined otherwise. Yeah, How yeah. would you define the budget? Yeah. You mentioned Force Awakens. Mm. There's some Star Wars fans in the room. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Talk about that. Uh, how early how early doors were you, were you involved in that particular project? We were probably involved about um, about a year before, I suppose. Um, and um, we started uh, initially just with designs. So the idea was that JJ was in the States, we were here. Um, we knew that we, the film would be made in the UK at Pinewood. Um, and Kathleen uh, and team, there was a, also a producer, Tommy Harper, who was involved, were really assembling a UK team of people and just testing the waters, I think. Yeah. Because one of the biggest things that, that we all that we all are uh, responsible for, I think, in front of all people like yourselves and thousands and millions of other people as well, is what I call the sort of, you know, the heart of Star Wars yeah. and what Star Wars is. And uh, I it would be unprofessional to mention any names, but I won't, no. Um, uh, we, there had been other people involved, and some of the designs, I think, had taken Star Wars away from the soul of Star Wars. Yeah. And I think that w one of the great things that we have here in the UK um, is, is I think we understand Star Wars very, very well. Uh, uh, you know, I don't know, it seems to be more, it, it, it comes to us, I think, maybe we're just closer to that real world that George wanted to hold on to. And so it was really, that was the most important thing, was to get to a place with JJ, the director, that he was confident that we were producing a um, faithful, world for, yeah. for him to be able to operate. He didn't want to throw away you know, everything and redesign it and take Star Wars in a whole 
in his, you know, not his world, just in a whole different way. He wanted it to be as authentic and as, as heartfelt as he possibly could. And so, so certainly with our designs, production design, the worlds, all those things, costume, all those things, needed time to, uh, you know, to sort of get to that place. And he want, he needed that journey with us. So it was, we did multiple designs of, of characters and, and creatures and aliens and things so that he could pull through those designs and begin to sort of do a kind of X-factor selection process yeah. whereby that was the group that most most felt that it was it was hitting the right note for him. Yeah. Um, and, and, and it was that was also a kind of a, a way of building a relationship with him and Kathy and, 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 and ultimately with Disney, but also as well, I think, um, allowing them the process to find themselves as well. So yeah. they had that time too. So it was an, it was it, that first formative part was very much about getting to know Star Wars, I yeah. think, and getting to know each other yeah. creatively. It's an interesting yeah. point, though, that in the in the most tactile, phys tactile physical sense, Star Wars is completely British. Yes. You know, yes. It's certainly the aesthetic, if not yeah. you know, the rest of it. So. Yeah, yeah, but it is. To, to grow that, yeah. yeah. Yeah, yeah, I agree. So what was the first creature you worked on, Force Awakens? So the first one we really sort of, I think, was the the Happer ball, which is the which and 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 and, and there's just a little, it's a fun thing really. If you, you imagine that you're a you're a, you're a producer and you make multi million dollar films and you're a director like J.J. Abrams and then you employ this group of people and you say to this producer, we've got this idea that we're going to build this creature and bring it to life and we're going to put sort of four people in it or six people in it. We're going to walk around and mm -hmm. should we do some kind of prototype? It takes a huge, I think a huge leap of faith or yeah. stupidity, <laughs> one or the other, to say yes to that. Okay. Uh, and it also takes a big leap of imagination to understand what the eventual thing will look like. Yeah. And so the Happer Boy is a good example of something that we built which was really a really simple carnival creature. It was a series of different shapes. We had these four or five puppeteers inside it, each one in a leg and uh, one for the front and the back, I think, which makes sense. Um, and we mocked that up in very, very simple terms, yeah. so very abstracted terms, really, to what the eventual creature would look like when we built it. But that was one of the first things that we sort of did, and I think that was a good for me, that was also a good test for how much um, bandwidth they would give to us, right. and, and and where their where, where they, their nerve might might be, uh, yeah. think. And concurrently, at the same time, with that big yeah, obviously, uh, and, uh, over there, uh, we began figuring out how we were going to do BBA. Yeah. You know, and, um, and and so to me. There's, there's the crazy end, and if we can do that, and JJ can engage in something as abstract and as, 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 as yeah. mad as that, and then at the other end was that this incredibly precious, incredibly important, you know, uh, sort of, uh, you know, the next R two D two, you know. So um, yeah, we needed to figure out how to bring that to life. Yeah, because like you say, that there's confidence on all sides. So to pick something that's crazy, big, monster, you wouldn't fit it through that door, sort of crazy thing, got the Apple ball. Yeah. And, and then right at the other end of the dial is something like BB-8, which yeah. is a droid, it's not a, yeah. you know, it, that, to land those two, to give them confidence in those two, must yeah. have been all the latitude for everything in between. Yeah, and I think it, the other thing is, is that there is a, a kind of, I suppose we all get this in our lives or whatever we do, but there's, there's, there is a sort of feeling that, um, that, that, it's a bit like when someone comes to fix your boiler yeah. and you know they charge you £150 to fix the boiler and all they did was hit it with a hammer. Yeah. And then you go, what, it cost me 150 quid for that? And it's like, yeah, but it's, it's knowing where to hit it. <laughs> and you know, so you're paying for that. Yeah. Uh, and what you have to trust is the hammer solution was the best solution possible. <laughs> and you know, if you remember that Cathy or whatever had, had in her past been involved with, say, Jurassic Park, with with you know, Stan Winston, and you're looking at some of the most phenomenally brilliant, but also complicated and hugely expensive things. Yeah. The T-Rex was masterful in, in all respects, yeah. but was also technologically right out on the edge of where they could be. And what we were suggesting was that we were going to completely throw all that out the window, and we were going to use tradition, uh, much more traditional, yeah. what we call mantronics, or should I call it now, peopletronics, yeah. <laughs> uh, as a way of bringing these things to life. Yeah. And I think that can be sometimes, 
uh, it's sometimes it's easy to blind people with science and they feel like their 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 money is being well spent because they can see it. Yeah. But when you suggest to someone, oh, the best way of bringing this to life is to put a person inside it or three people inside it, or do it this way or that way, then I think that that is also something which you you know we had to tread tentatively with to see if they would uh, you know certainly JJ as a director would engage in that kind of a thing. Yeah. So yeah. Um, and sometimes the best option really is a bit of fishing wire. Well, yeah, I, I mean that has become absolutely our mantra across all the Star Wars films. I mean there are there are some beautifully, uh, there are some characters which are astoundingly yeah. sophisticated and, and technologically, uh, you know, uh, very very um, uh, clever and, 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 and right on the edge of what we're capable of doing technologically. But the majority of the characters are brought to life yeah. using people like Ryan, yeah. uh, you know, who 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 bring. Who bring real, real emotions to those characters? Because there is no, there is very little filter between between their their actuarial and performing skills and the creature that they're doing, and, and that technology will always get in the way of that. Yeah. You know, um, yeah. that's why Jim was, was again. I, I, you know, that's why Kermit's Kermit. Yeah. So there's nothing between Kermit and Jim's hand, or right, you know. Yoda was Yoda. Yeah, yeah, exactly. It's, yeah, yeah. The the puppet sitting right there on you yeah. know, Frank's hand hasn't got the life, has it? The puppet. It's the performer that puts the life. Yeah, into absolutely. The, yeah, yeah. yeah. It, it, it can be the most sophisticated, clever. You know, we can be as proud as we want it to be, of, and, and you know, you know, chuffed about how well we've made it. But unless it lives on screen, it has it's no value at all. It has no value. Yeah. Has there ever been a creature that you've created or worked on as a team that you thought that feels like it's going to pop off the screen? And sometimes the camera just doesn't get it, or, or sometimes it just doesn't work. And conversely, is there ever been a creature when you thought, well, he'll be sitting at the back of the bar, and he's been brought right to the front? You've, you've got to prepare everything as if it's the superstar character. You do, yeah, absolutely. You, you, I mean, it's slightly, it's slightly a problem, that, really, yeah. because um, every character that we, that we do, and we try to sort of attend to that, I think, on a more economic level, uh, we have to. Uh, but what we tended to do over, over the film, certainly, and I include Rogue One, I include so in, in, in the films, that, that not just the, the, the main trilogy, um, is that you would never know ultimately where a character was going to be used. And so you, we, would, we would lavish it with the same level of, of um, attention. And, um, and that, can be, that can be incredibly rewarding. It can also be, on the reverse side, disappointing yeah. because you know, I often say, and I don't mean this to quite sound the way it is, but some of the best work we've done you'll never see. Right. Because it doesn't make it to the screen. You know, not everything you do uh, always gets to that place of prominence uh, where, where, in a sense, it's like, well, OK, that's, there's the reward for everybody's efforts. Yeah. yeah. So it's tough. It's, it's tough from that sense to keep, to make sure that you keep the enthusiasm level up and you, you keep the commitment up. Uh, it's a gamble, you know. You're, we're all playing a game of gamble. Yeah. And there are certain characters you know are going to be featured. Sure. Certainly, they're bankable, and you, you know, BB-8 or you know Yoda or um, um, you know Sabat Table, for instance, is a, a great example of where you we knew that those characters around the table were integral part of yeah. the narrative. Yeah. They would definitely be filmed alongside um, the actors as, uh, and would, would be as featured as the actors, yeah. whereas many other of them are just part of the Star Wars world. Yeah. Because I suppose it, uh, ultimately it gets laid out to the director and he makes choices and yeah. the editor might ever give it a pit or whatever. It's, Absolutely, yeah. yeah. It's all fodder yeah. for that. Yeah, yeah. It's, and the mercy of the cut, as they always say, because yeah. you only have X amount of time to tell a movie. Yes, yeah. So, yeah. In terms of innovation, which is obviously a, a big part of what you do, <clears throat> just sketch it out from when you started in Force Awakens to when you finished in Rise of Skywalker. What was the leap? Because it felt like it felt like Force Awakens was a massive leap to get to where that was. Mm -hmm. But you're talking what four or five years before you get to the next, you know, to the final mm -hmm. part of that trilogy. Were there many innovations that made life easier? That gave you other options? I think I think technology moves ahead very slowly in little little nibs, you know, and it's really difficult to quantify it. Yeah. And it's a collective thing. So what happens is the team of people that work with us from um, the beginning right through to now. Have all have been mostly hold that family together, sure. and I think on an individual level, each person has has grown in some way. Our understanding and, and our communication, our ability to be able to work alongside each other, has grown and come together. 
There are real points, though, where, if, for instance, if you look at, say, Mass, um, you know, originally Mass was going to be a puppet in the first instance. Yeah. Finding the design for Mass was phenomenally difficult, and we really didn't get to that point until almost the very end of Force yeah. Awakens. Way too late to have done something in animatronics. But then by the end of it, we were able to then create, you know, uh, 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 what, uh, what I think is probably the best animatronic entity we've ever made. Yeah. And again, um, it, it is a real shame. There was huge, uh, there's a lot of sequences that were shot with Mass um, uh, around the layer, the whole layer story, uh, that don't make it to the end of the film. But I can say at least with conviction that when we shot that puppet, and I think JJ would back me up on this if he'll if be here, it, she was, she, as, as a, a practical effect, she was phenomenal. Yeah. And, and that was literally down to the control system, uh, the, the engineering, the animatronics, the skin technology, the painting of the skin, the making of the eyeballs, all that stuff was, I think, poured into Maz. And, and I think everybody that contributed to it were, 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 were at the very, the very highest end, really. The other side is, does technology develop? I think it's, technology implies that it has to be something that we maybe don't understand or is new or we invented. I think what we did, though, develop was, was almost an, un, an, un, an unbreakable confidence, in, or certainly I had an, un, an unwaverable confidence in the people that I was working with to be able to do anything that I was asked of. So by, and I still do, but by the end of the trilogy, I would be able to sit in a meeting with, with a director, you know, with JJ or whoever, and they would say, well, you can do that, can't you? And my answer would just be yes. Yeah. Because I, we had really, uh, you know, so on Jurassic, it was we, it just, that's, that's technology in its own way. Yeah. The technology is, is, is a sum total, isn't it, of, of everybody's yeah. skills yeah, yeah. that create an entity at the end, not an individual advancement in an electric motor or anything like that. Yeah. Um, so yes, we, we had progressed to the point, I think, of almost complete confidence of, in, in, in what we wanted to try and do. Because it's part yeah. of that collaboration. Yeah, absolutely. And I yeah. suppose one innovation, one tweak, one adjustment absolutely. in the positive yeah. sense helps everything, doesn't yeah. it? Yeah, yeah. And that's happening in the mould mold world, where the mould makers are making a mould and, and they fight, figure a new way, a slightly different approach. It, it tweaks your yeah. understanding. And Kenny, Wilson, who's our, the head of our mold shop, always coins this place, this place to say it's a 40, 50 year apprenticeship. And I think that's really quite true, really. Which is what makes the job so fabulous for people, you know? Yeah. Because you're, you're, you're not ever, not ever, always repeating what you, you, you're always, they are also pushing and testing yeah. themselves, which is, which is what makes it engaging. Yeah. So given that attitude yourself, you never stop learning, and nobody ever stops learning, but, but certainly in your trade, you never stop learning, learning. It must be delightful then when something comes along. But you th thought five years ago, ah, we're never going to get to that, and all of a sudden somebody figures it out. And he yeah, yeah. I mean, it, yeah. It's it's it's. I mean, I'm so lucky because, in a sense, that you know, where where I where I I'm 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 uh, I. People do these things, and I get to witness what they're doing. Sure. So I get the joy of the net result, yeah. you know. And then you know, uh, I mean. I think it was just, we call him Six Eyes. I think he, 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 I'm terrible at remembering real proper Star Wars names, but if the, the character oh, in Solo, um, I mean, you know, Gustav Ho Hosen that made the mechanism for that yeah. excelled, and Matt Denton, who is uh, 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 essentially our software stroke performance control um, uh, head expert, whatever. I don't quite know how to define Matt. He's, he's a, a enormously um, intelligent human being. I mean, really, again, wrote, wrote a control software performance-based package that allowed that code to come to life. And, you know, I, I had no, until the last minute when it gets turned on, and then, you know, someone like Brian or whatever puts their hands in it and starts bringing it to life, then you suddenly see how, just how wonderful all these people's work is, how, yeah. how it's come together. And, it's astounding. Yeah, you know, it's, it's wow. That's you know, uh, it's beyond expectation. Sure, which is you know. And right. the most important element of all of that is the payload, isn't it? The performance. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. yeah, the ability to be able to perform it. Yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. yeah, it's um, yeah, and and performing performance is something which is not 
is not defined either. It's an it, it's an inter it's it's a it's a collective it's an interactive thing between yeah. between what's happening in the moment on the set, and um, therefore it needs to remain uh, organic, flexible yeah. in the yeah. same way. Whereas whereas performance could sometimes be defined in the Disney sense of the word in the theme parks as being pre-programmed or something that has it's fixed. Yeah. Uh, uh, performance that we do for an animatronic is it happens in real time and it happens. Uh, it's directable. It's being directed in the same way well. as the actors are. Yeah. 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 And that makes it that makes it very different, I think. Of the five projects that we're talking about, which one was the most overwhelming in the sense of there's a lot of moving parts, there's a lot of things to figure out. I mean, my head's telling me Canto Bite, but maybe it was something else. What What was the one that you thought, wow, that's a chunk of work? Um, I, I suppose, to be honest, I, th I think I, I think Force Awakens still stands as that because because it was it was it was all of us coming together for the for for, for the first time, some of us, and doing something that was that was. A, a, a group, a, a collective thing. We were also going to take this onto location. We were going to take it out of our, our comfort zone and out of our support zone. We were, we had every type of kind of puppet on that show in a yeah. sense. We were also a lead character, so the pressure on us to be able to consistently perform in a lead role, not just in a supportive role. So across the board, that, I think that, that, that film tested all of those things. So when we came to work with Brian, yeah. then we were much more confident, of, I think, of what he was able to throw at us. So something like Sea Cow, which seems on the surface to be much more difficult, flying it in on a helicopter yeah. into a location in Ireland and setting it all up, kind of does on paper. But in actual fact, it was more just a case of re going through the same experiences that we'd gone through by taking um, uh, you know, the, the characters uh, yeah. abroad on um, Force Awakens. Yeah. When we spoke before, you said that there's, there's a budget. Uh, it's not a fixed budget for a specific thing, but a budget. So when you mentioned the, the, the CK as an example, of when we spoke before, you said, well, why wouldn't we do it? Why wouldn't we do it? Why, why would you let it and do it if we can build it and make it happen? Mm -hmm. So that must give you pride when you put it on that mountainside yeah. and anchor it down and all that stuff. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. yeah. I mean, the, the, the true reality is, is the practical effects are still cheaper than digital effects, yeah. Yeah. whichever way you look at it. And, and so, you know, you, you can have an internal debate about whether you believe that, you know, how, why do practical effects, uh, why, do, why do people respond to practical effects? Differently than they do to digital effects, which is better, which is whatever, which is generational. Is it just that I'm old and I like practical effects and I like digital effects? But if I was younger, I wouldn't. Yeah. I don't, all of that is so so thing. But on a, a pure budget economic level, um, it is it is always better to shoot something and get it in camera yeah. and have it there already on the negative than it is to go into a post production scenario and have to generate it later. I think and and whether that will change as the years go on, I'm not really quite sure. Yeah. I think when you look at digital and you look at the huge amount of work that they have to do in order to create a digital character, it's not dissimilar to what we have to do, to be honest. They are building it from the bones up, you know, as we are. So, I, you know, and then they have to, you know, animate it, composite it, and do all those things that we don't have to worry about because we're there on the day. Yeah. So that expense is already taken care Yeah, because you've got the physical thing on set there. And yeah. Is there. Has there been a character or a creature that you've, you've seen performed or, or in show and tell or whatever, you know, in test, that you suddenly, wow, I, I didn't expect it to be able to do that. I didn't expect the performer to be able to make it do that. Something that really came alive in the moment that maybe you weren't quite expecting to be so impressive. Um, there's a lot of them. Um, <laughs> When you see when you see people offer back, as it were, a performance. Yeah. I think, to be honest, though it didn't make it to the screen in completely in a completely practical sense, because ultimately it, it, it was it was it was modified with CG later. The um, I'm going to call it the snake because again, uh, I uh, I suffer to remember what the the real name was. It Brian probably knows what it is. The Vexus. The Vexus. Yeah. Was a was a 
puppet that we built that was essentially based on a piece of, of extract hose. Um, the idea of getting a big piece of extract hose that was big enough for people to climb in it, yeah. and Brian climbed in it at one point, and uh, crawl around inside it and bring it to life by physically rolling around and then having this thing on a pole arm. You know, on paper it just sounds like the crudest entity on the planet. But actually when we shot that in, inside the cavern, and with Daisy and, and JJ and everybody else, it was it was amazing, and uh, it had power, it had presence, it had weight, it had everything that one would hope to to do practically. Yeah. Yet it was the simplest, cheapest version of something that you could ever imagine, yeah. and, and that that was 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 a surprise, yeah. uh, a good surprise, because yeah. obviously we gambled on that. But I was surprised at just how well how well that worked, and 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 it would have been it's a shame that in a sense we had to or they you know that it was necessary to do some CG uh, recoloration because sometimes I think it often feels like maybe you know that contribution was a little lost. But personally, I don't feel that yeah. it existed very much in that world, and the people responsible for performing and building it. Their work was still very much on screen, and yeah. and for that, I, you know, it's still I'm still I'm, I'm, I'm very proud of that character yeah. That, yeah. For, for what everybody did. Yeah, yeah. because yeah. there's a marriage between practical and digital. Uh, certain things that, like you know, it's a great example, obviously that I then will then come in or whichever effects house and, and enhance yeah. things. Yeah. That is that something when you go into a scenario, you you sometimes you've got to be prepared to expect that to happen. And is yeah. there no you get the words, no way you go, it's not whatever's the best thing on screen at the end is, is the best result in the end? I think if you went back 20 years, there was huge egos involved, mine included. I mean, and when you're running your own company and then there's this new technology that comes along, it's a threat. Yeah. And your natural commercial instincts is to, to be competitive in, in any sense of the word. And when you're winning a contract, or you're, you, and, and, and you're, in a sense, you're, you're overhead, etc., all that sort of stuff. So I think what happened was when digital emerged as being a really, a really viable proposition, there was there was generally competitive not not only within the digital world but certainly between digital and practical and that's not just ourselves that's special effects that's construction that's all the areas that digital would affect and I think for ten years or maybe longer than that that's exactly what it was but then I think what happened is what happens is that it settles down after a while and I suppose that it separates the is it the wheat from the chaff and the strong contenders the wetters of the world the ILMs of the world. You know, uh, get to a place where they're less insecure about who they are. Therefore, you start to look at what you're doing as a visual effect again. And as we all come from the same place in our souls, yeah. then you start to think, how is the best way of doing this? And when you're working on a film that is ultimately being paid for by one company, so therefore it doesn't really help you to be any more competitive. If you're, we essentially are employed by Disney, so are the, so are ILM, but they're owned by Disney, so am I. Um, and uh, so therefore that removes that as well. So you know, there's no commercial competition, now it's purely creative. And I still personally don't believe that we have done enough and, and, and there has not yet been the perfect combination of practical digital effects. Right. I would love, I still think there's a huge, there's a really amazing, there's some amazing stuff to come yeah. if the opportunity was ever allowed to be able to really do both.